Hey guys, today we are going to tour the Chippewa Valley Ethanol Company in Benson, Minnesota. So he's getting probed right now. They're taking corn out of there, as I've explained in my other videos, and they'll they'll take that corn into the house there and they'll test it, get a test weight on it, and uh, check it for damage and anything like that. And then he'll continue on over the scale and back into the dump pits. Does most all of your grain come from local farmers? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so you're not bringing it from how far away, or how far would you say most of oh, it comes from? Probably 30 miles. Definitely. Within 30 miles, yeah. okay. And uh, we don't have any rail receiving for grain, so everything's trucked it's in. It's trucked in from the farmers. The farmers. Um, you know, there's times in the year we'll, where we'll buy some commercial bushels uh, from a local elevator or something like that. Yep. It's still coming from the farmers, but not direct. Right. But, uh, I would say probably 85% is pretty much direct purchase from right from the growers. Sure. So, and how many bushels of corn do you go through per day? We go through uh, 49 thousand bushels a day roughly right wow there, give or take 500 bushels so yeah 50 trucks a day got to come through here just to feed feed the, the unit and how many gallons of ethanol is that per, per day is about 140,000 142,000 right in there per day yep is that seven days a week that is seven days a week 24 hours a day and so how many millions of gallons of ethanol are you guys producing here so we're we're essentially we call ourselves a 50 million gallon facility we we generally are at 49 million 800 49 50 you know, about right 50 here. million 50 million gallons wow that's a busy place so these are the fermenters so how does that process work the corn gets ground and then we uh, we add water and we make a slurry, and then in that slurry we put in uh, enzymes to break down the sugars, and then we put in yeast to consume the sugars and turn it into alcohol. The, the yeast changed the sugars into ethanol, glycol, and some other impurities, and then carbon dioxide. That unit back there is a CO2 scrubber. It takes all the CO2 and condenses it. From there we feed it out to the uh, RTO and we superheat it to 1200 degrees as we exhaust it. Essentially it's sterilized before it's exhausted. Interesting. The fermenter that's closest to the process building uh, is the one we, we flush and clean when we do an organic run. Same process but it's all separated. It's kept separate to keep it organic. Yep. You're talking about the organic production. What do you guys do with that and what's the purpose of doing that versus non-organic? So the organic process, uh, we do that and that is uh, goes into organic beverage and organic industrial for body care products, lotions, hand sanitizers, all that kind of thing. We do that for the organic side and then we do that as well for the industrial side. After we've made the fuel, we'll actually process it again distill it one more time and so we get an ultra clean ethanol uh, that can be used in those processes. Creating other that. products rather than You're just ethanol just for fuel. On the fuel side of it. Right. Inside there there's two large generators that can operate the plant in the summertime you say when the demand is high they can yep. shut the electricity off for the plant and run those generators there and operate the entire plant off of those. I can see they've got uh, economizers and anti-pollution stuff on the top of there so uh, that was installed about four years ago so they're uh, clean running to meet all the uh, Minnesota pollution control standards. parts here there's an organic hammer mill and then there's the main fuel hammer mill okay in the background there. Yeah. two separate sets of hammer mills two 
separate legs. One's running the main core in for the other bin site, and then the optional organic site here. Okay. lab area here but yeah so uh pretty good size good lab. thing your head wasn't um, still in that onyx we've got again here a lot of things are kind of doubled up because we do the industrial and the fuel side so we've got some machines that are set up for one some machines that are set up for the other and there's some processes that we can do either or on so test moisture on the feed product in here um, testing the quality of, of the different products we're making in here Everything that goes out of here has got to, got to come through here with some sort of sampling. And then like... Uh, so that's mainly what you're doing in here is sampling the products and yep. making sure everything yep. is up to standards. So we'll do the fermenter counts, you know, what's our yeast activities looking like? Are we, are we getting the proper growth of the yeast? Pretty important spot. You don't want product quality doing like right. this. Somebody gets used to using your product, you want to kind of give them that same thing over and over again so they, they come to rely and know what you're going to get. Um, Make sure you maintain those quality standards, yep. yeah. Yep. After the corn is dumped back in the receiving, it ends up coming up here. This is where it all begins over here, really. Yep. Okay. Really. Construction going on, that's a uh, thin stillage clarification that we're building. Uh, that'll take additional solids out of the kind of the processed um, products. And then uh, we got to dry all that back out for the market. So by getting it cleaner, we'll be more efficient, and we'll have to put less BTUs into the drying process. So okay. Um, so right now you guys are updating it in order to increase the efficiency. Correct. Recently, in the last eight years, we've increased our our energy efficiency on on BTUs 24 percent. Wow. So. Just a little over $5 million in the last seven years on energy projects. Just trying to increase the efficiency all the time. Yep. Wow. So these are the fuel loadout racks. Uh, we ship out by truck or by rail car. Probably in the last uh, six, eight months, majority of it's actually gone to truck. Uh, you know, we, you and I talked a little bit about the E15 usage really has been increasing in the state of Minnesota. So we've actually been in, been putting more into the truck market just to feed that additional demand that we're seeing. So this is the final. This is where the final product gets this loaded is where out. The final Every, product gets loaded out. Everything that comes through the plant ends up leaving right here, whether it's by rail or by truck. Yep, from the ethanol perspective, this is the final destination for the feed product. Okay. So you've got truck and rail that go out through this open bay there. Sure. On the feed side. And uh, when you say on the feed side, can you explain what you mean by that, where the feed comes from? So and all the solids that are left, um, so like I said, we're, we're putting this in to separate things out better. So after things come out of fermentation, uh, we, we separate the liquids from the solids. The solids then get dried and go out as a feed product, distilled, distillers dried grains. And uh, the liquids, we pull the ethanol out, and you're left with uh, some nut, some nutrients in there that we call a syrup, and that's the portion that we're gonna we're gonna take additional solids out of here, because then we have to concentrate that up, and we'll actually put that back onto the dried distillers grain, so we add that nutrient back. But that's the syrup process. So uh, <clears throat> all of that will go back together and, and get dried, and we're just trying to get a li a additional moisture out of that syrup product so that we don't have to put as much energy towards drying the product. Sure. Uh, the product wants to be dry so you can store it, so you can handle it well, so that it you know it transports and moves and, and uh, those types of things. Uh, yep. We also can do wet product, but wet product, if it doesn't get used right away, it can start to spoil, you can start to have bacteria issues and those types of things. So. Sure, sure. So for those who may not know what he's talking about, after the ethanol process is done and after they've made the gas, they have a byproduct left, 
which they then turn into feed for local livestock. Is it all sold to local farmers then? So you're selling back to the local livestock or where does that end up going? So uh, all the wet stuff actually goes to local. Some of the dried stuff, because it's portable really, uh, can go to different places. We've got several local places that are taking it. If it goes on rail, then it's probably going out to the uh, to the west coast. Okay. The dairies out there. Okay. I think that's one of the big common myths of ethanol is that people assume we're taking all of our food and creating gasoline for cars with this. And and really that, that's not the total truth. There is a lot of byproduct left over that's turned into a really high quality feed that then gets sold back to those same farmers that would have needed that feed anyway. Yes. The, the reality is is what two thirds of it's turned into energy through the ethanol, about one third of it is returned as a concentrated feed to the cattle. And we're essentially utilizing corn that probably would have been ground and fed to those same animals anyway. So right. we're, we're doing that, getting the energy and giving them back a, a really good feed product. Right. Everything's stored in its own contained area. Separated by the product that it is. Yep. What he was just explaining to us is They've got a system over here where the loadout is at. If they ever would have any kind of a spill through the rail or through the truck, there's a system to catch that spill and actually take it underground where they've got a uh, containment system underneath the ground over there to store that product. That way it's not anything that would harm the environment. Uh, so this is your feed here, your dried feed. Yeah. And what happens is as it comes off the dryers, uh, and then it comes in here and there's a tempering process. So we'll We'll switch from pile to pile so that it, it's gone through its kind of cure stage. Okay. And then, then we're ready to ship it. So you can see once it's cured, it just kind of breaks up and flows. Yeah. And while it's curing, it kind of piles up. So uh, So he must be loading it out right now. I can see it being pulled through yep. the floor. Is there there must be a truck out there so somewhere that's loading? There's a truck out there. You can see on the scale 81.5 is where he's at right now. So. Okay winter time you can probably load up to 88,000 so yep so this is the DDGs or the dried distillers grains yep. this is the leftover dried product of what they've got after they make the ethanol this is going out right now for animal feed so essentially it is de-sugared corn we've taken all of the sugar out of it all the yep. starches and so uh, so the pericarb and uh, and all of that that's left is in this product right here. Sure. Which is which is what makes it such a high, highly concentrated, highly value protein feed. Yep. And so any of the other nutrients or anything like that that would have been soluble uh, came out. We we concentrated those liquids up and then we put it back into the product as well. So uh, really all we took out was oil corn oil and uh, the starch. Sure. Pretty cool, huh? That's the same stuff we saw inside. It just hasn't been dried down yet, is that right? That's right yeah. So it's just a super high moisture right now. You've got to dry it down or else that'll spoil pretty quickly. How long before that'll spoil? So about, we have uh, three days according to our permitting. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. This is the thermal oxidizer. So this is where we superheat everything that goes out of the plant and 
So actually what you see coming out, uh, people say, oh, there's all that smoke, but really that's just water vapor that's going out and sure. going out hot so that there's no stuff in it uh, that could hurt anybody. Um, Is that what's drying out of the wet cake then? Yep. So that's that's yep. the steam leaving the wet cake, so turning now, it into DDGs. The stuff off the dryer, all of that goes through this stack. It has to be superheated again. Okay. Uh, or it can the stability. The other thing you'll see is, is out here, that's the cooling towers. And so when the fermenters, when those yeasts are, are chewing on that sugar, they're creating heat. And if, if things get too warm, it'll kill the yeast. So in that process, we got to keep the fermenters at a, at a steady temperature. Okay. And so we'll we'll run water uh, across, so the the mash or the beer that's in the fermenter goes on one side, and water goes on the other side, so we can transfer that heat. Once the water is warmed up, then we need to take it back and cool it back down, so we can use it again. Sure. So the water goes in, and it. it goes across the radiator and then there's a big fan up at the top that draws air across those radiators. And so in the winter time you'll see steam coming off of there just because it's it's warm air that's yep. uh, coming off of there. But again that's all it's all just water that uh, we're utilizing. Sure. And, uh, and it's just to make that process as efficient as possible, let those yeast convert it at, at a really specific temperature that they really like. So interesting. We redid our, our uh, cooling towers two years ago uh, because we needed we needed more efficient conversion. Um, we had two older systems that operated differently. They weren't as efficient, uh, so we tore those down and we, and we built a brand new uh, unit that really gives us more of the cooling capacity we want at, at a better energy usage. So this is where all the organic and the uh, industrial products get loaded out. So you had the fuel down there. This is the same setup here. You got trucks on the one side, rail cars on the other side, and uh, this is where that that industrial product goes. And, and uh, that that may go into you know some of our egg chemicals that we use to control weeds in production. Uh, may go to cosmetics. May go to paint supplies, stuff like that. So. So that's what this building is. Okay, it's all just specialty products kind of kind of thing. Yeah. The gasifier is no longer in use, and uh, but that was a, a product we were taking uh, biomass, corn cobs, corn stover. We were turning it into uh, a gasified product, so we were kind of burning it without burning it. So partially burning it, and then we were taking the gas that was produced off of that, and we were feeding a boiler and creating energy. Gas prices had been, you know, really high, so uh, that really looked like the thing that was going to happen. And then we found uh, shale gas out in North Dakota. Sure. And natural gas prices went from seven, eight, nine, ten dollars per mmbtu back down to three dollars per mmbtu. And at sure. that point, um, it cost too much. Yep. To do this, and uh, by the time you you put the fuel into trucking it and all of that kind of stuff, it just wasn't cost effective anymore. So so we had to go back to using natural gas. Okay. But, uh, so the natural gas, basically, the lower price of the natural gas just made it more cost effective to stick with that. Yep. The less energy we can use, the better off. The more environmentally friendly things are, um, and. A lot of stuff now, they're starting to track carbon intensity scores. Uh, California, Oregon, Washington, uh, Alberta, British Columbia are all starting to track uh, carbon intensity scores. They call it a CI score. Sure. Um, we've currently got certifications for British Columbia and Alberta to be able to ship gallons into them. Uh, formerly, we had uh, certifications to ship into Europe uh, with an ISCC. Um, certification which again is a, a carbon or a energy audit process to make sure that you're you know meeting the requirements that they want so, so basically you have to prove that you're you are up to a certain efficiency level yes. and you meet certain standards in order to get approval for that correct yep. okay. are you cold you look a little cold yeah you do look cold all of the gallons that we have stored out here are, are drinkable 
Okay. We denature it as it goes into the trucks or the rail cars. So, so it, it's, it's a drinkable product over there. Yeah. As it's as it's loaded into the trucks here. That's where you will, when you say denature, basically you mix in the- Gasoline. Gasoline. Two percent? Two percent. Okay, two yeah. percent gasoline. That. And so the reality is, is like, the alcohol, if you smell it, just like, right. Some, you know, it's pretty natural. No beaches have ever been closed due to an ethanol spill. So uh, think about that. Essentially, if, if you spilled el alcohol into water, you might have a few happy fish, but you know, they're not, it's, it's not gonna plug anything up, it's not gonna clog it, it's just gonna dissipate into the water and right. disappear. Right. So since you mix so much water in with this corn in order to make the product, what's the reason for not being able to accept wet corn? So we actually have, you know, we'll, we'll accept wet corn uh, to a point. But what happens is when the corn gets a little too wet, then it, it increases energy usage at the hammer mill. So okay. we're trying to force that, we're flaking that corn, right? Yep. And so we, we want to be consistent with what we're putting at that so we can run it efficiently. And if we get big swings in moisture, then the, the load on the, on the hammer mills will go up and down. Sure. And so then again, process, for you guys, it's all about efficiency. It's all about efficiency. Yep. And if we don't have a control on how much moisture we're putting into the fermenters, we don't know how much water to add to get the enzyme and the yeast to be active. Sure. So we're we're, we're trying to cook, bake, if you will, yep. Yep. a very detailed um, mixture. And, yep. uh, and so you want to control all the pieces of the recipe and, and the moisture that comes in. We can, we can handle some of it and we'll work with the guys. Um, you know, to, to be able to take some, some wetter stuff, especially during harvest and those types of things. But we're really trying to be very consistent with, with the different pieces. Sure, that makes sense. Out of this. Yep, so that's of, one bushel of corn right there. Corn 56 pounds of corn. Is giving us 2.9 gallons of alcohol. Yep. Uh, what is it, about 17 pounds of uh, DDGs and uh, about six and a half to seven tenths of a of a gallon of corn oil. Of corn oil. Corn oil. And so this crude oil, corn oil, would be used to biodiesel, um, those types of processes. Sure, so there's all different kinds of products that can be made from that. Yep. And so even just looking here, this is interesting, there's one bushel here, and yet there's this much feed that remains after you've made all of that. Yep. We've actually made in the past beverage with some wheat and some rye, that's what the Shakers brand was. Uh, currently, we're making some beverage with uh, the organic corn. Yep. That's, that's what the, the Prairie brand is. Um, we've made some, some other alcohols that uh, were non-organic. And, uh, and then we've got, you know, product that goes into mouthwash. So these are all products that stuff that comes out of this factory is, is in. in. Yep. Yep, that's interesting. So this is all stuff that, when you think of an ethanol plant, I think most people wouldn't think about mouthwash and bug spray and hand sanitizer. Yeah. So you make the organic vodka right now. Yes. But you've also made non-organic, or do you currently still make non-organic? Uh, we we still are we're we're providing. So there's kind of a trend right now happening with little, like we had micro breweries. Yep. Now yep. we're seeing micro distilleries. Okay. So people are buying our alcohol feedstock, and then they're doing a final distillation process with it, maybe adding some flavors or different things like that, and then they're they're bottling it uh, into a regional market and selling. Oh, so, that's interesting. Yeah. So, so we're seeing a lot of that where we're we're just selling a couple hundred gallons of a product, and then they're turning it into a whiskey or or something like to that. Turn making it into their own creation. Yep. Sure. So. How's the taste difference between the two vodkas? Do you have samples? <laughs> yeah. One of the big things I hear on ethanol is that guys, guys don't like the subsidies. They complain about the government subsidies helping ethanol out and how ethanol should be able to stand on its own feet, you know, rather than collecting subsidies from the government. Now, I know the answer here, but why don't you go ahead and explain your idea on the subsidies, so, ethanol subsidies right now. The tax credit, again, was you know, as you produced and you just took 
a reduction in your tax base. Yep. Um, and that actually disappeared in ooh, 2012, 2013. And we gave that up um, in a negotiation with the oil refiners to try and back off of some of their false advertising. So as far as money coming in from subsidies right now, there hasn't been any coming into ethanol for several years now. Several years. Yeah. Right. And well, I think that's something that would shock a lot of people when, they, when they're looking for reasons to dislike ethanol. Yeah, I think uh, so ethanol this year's right around zero dollars and I think um, crude oil refining uh, still have tax subsidies right around four to four point two billion dollars. Sure. So yeah. So <laughs> so know, oil level can't, the playing field right, would be kind absolutely, of nice. absolutely. Is when you in the winter time we live in Minnesota, right? Yep. You see the the yellow and the red cans of heat that we right. buy to. That's ethanol. <laughs> that's what that is. That's what that additive is. Yeah. Sure. It's ethanol. So uh, you know we 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 buy heat. To try and make things run a little bit better, yep. or, or that's ethanol. That's what sure. we're putting in. Wow. So for those who don't know, for for the people that are not in Minnesota, what heat is is it's a product that you can put in in your car or in your small engines in order to uh, help help the fuel from attracting water. That's the deal, right? So that you won't have freeze up and have problems with with your fuel system in that vehicle. So we are driving back to the receiving facility now. This is where the trucks dump. You can see the big bins here. I don't know the exact bushels on those bins, but they are massive. How big are those bins? Those bins are each uh, rated for 730,000 bushels. 730,000 each. Yep. I think, uh, you know, typically... It's a lot of bushels. Yeah. So this is the receiving pit here. How large? Do you know how many bushels the pits actually hold? Uh, I don't know how much it holds. You could probably get two and a half trucks in it, I would guess, before it came up top. In the pit? 20,000 bushels an hour is how fast this pit will go through, as long as you keep it fed. 20,000 bushels in one hour. So this is, is the pit? This is the pit right here, yeah. I've never been down here before. Well, thanks to Chad and Brody for the tour. It is cold and windy out here. The boys are hiding in the truck and I don't blame them. But I appreciate the tour, guys. Thanks for taking us with and letting us do this. This is really cool. One of the things I'm really impressed with with ethanol is how efficient they continue to make this process. Every time I learn something new about ethanol, it seems like it focuses around efficiency. They are finding more and more ways to make sure that they're making this this gas more efficient and that there's they're using the byproducts more efficiently everything about this place is set up for efficiency and they keep continuing to make it more and more efficient so that as consumers and as farmers and as people who care about the environment we're doing the right thing so thanks to everybody at chippewa valley ethanol company for letting me come out here and make this video today